Hi, so good morning, everybody. Once again, um, just continuing the show. It's a great, it's a great show that we have. This section is about is for the presentation of oral abstracts. There are eight abstracts to be presented. How it works is that there'll be five minutes of the presenter and then five minutes of questions. And uh, I'll do the first four, and my colleague Kabir uh, will do the will do the will do the second four. And so it's a really rapid turnaround, but uh, we and but there's some really interesting things uh, are, are up for grabs here. And uh, and don't hesitate to throw in your questions. Um, let's uh, let's get on with it, please. The first, um, uh, Kabir, did you want to, to say hello? Say anything special? Good morning. No, uh, Kabir Mahdi from Mayo Clinic, and um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks to the uh, to uh, to you and and Funda and and the. Klanja Karsanoma Foundation. Uh, so yeah, let's get it. Let's get it going. We've got some great stuff to great. present. Great. To kick off, uh, Islam Bayev from the Mass General is going to talk to us about uh, some work on hypercalcemia that he's done. Um, welcome, and uh, you're away. Great. Thank you, Dr. Bridgewater. Uh, and I'd also like to thank Dr. Merrick Bernstam in the organizing committee for selecting our abstract for a poster presentation. Um, as Dr. Bridgewater said, my name is Islam Baev and I'm a clinical research coordinator at the Massachusetts General Hospital Cancer Center. Today I'll be discussing the incidence, disease characteristics, and survival outcomes in patients diagnosed with advanced cholangiocarcinoma who experience hypercalcemia. Hypercalcemia is one of the most common metabolic complications of malignancy occurring in about 5 to 30 percent of patients with cancer during the course of their disease. A hypercalcemia malignancy arises via four main mechanisms, of which the most common is excessive production of parathyroid hormone-related protein. Hyper hypercalcemia has been studied in other cancers and is associated with a poor prognosis, but it hasn't been well studied in cholangiocarcinoma. In this study, we aim to evaluate the incidence of hypercalcemia in patients with advanced cholangiocarcinoma. We also aim to characterize the clinical phenotype and genomic associations understand the management of hypercalcemia and the prognostic implications. Patients with a histologically confirmed cholangiocarcinoma who are seen at MGH and diagnosed between 2009 and 2019 were included in this retrospective study. We divided patients into four cohorts. Two cohorts were for patients with intrahepatic and, uh, and extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. In order to adequately assess the frequency of hypercalcemia in the, uh, in the population, we required a minimum of five documented serum calciums and albumins over the course of at least six months. Those were the eligibility criteria for the main cohort, which I will be focusing on for this presentation. But we also wanted to assess the prevalence of hypercalcemia, a diagnosis, and the prognostic implications of this. So we separately evaluated patients with a serum, calcium, and albumin within 30 days of diagnosis of advanced disease in the diagnosis cohort. Here we evaluated the incidence of hypercalcemia in advanced cholangiocarcinoma. We found that hypercalcemia occurs more commonly in ICC than ECC, with an incidence of 33% versus 16%. This 33% is quite high compared to other cancers, where the incidence tends to range from as low as 5% in prostate cancer to about 30% in multiple myeloma. There were several clinical characteristics we looked at, such as age at diagnosis, gender, uh, presentation of disease, sites of metastases, and CA-99 at diagnosis. We found that patients with hypercalcemia were more likely uh, were more likely to present with primary metastatic disease in ICC and with metastases to at least three organs in both ICC and ECC, suggesting that hypercalcemia was associated with a higher burden of disease. A very interesting finding in the study was the association of hypercalcemia with a genotype. When we looked at patients who had molecular profiling of their tumor tissue, and specifically in patients with IDH1 mutated cholangiocarcinoma and IDH1 wild type cholangiocarcinoma, we found that 57% of patients with IDH1 mutations experienced hypercalcemia compared to 25% uh, of patients uh, who did not have an IDH1 mutation. 
this was a statistically significant finding and we don't have an explanation for it, uh, for this phenomenon, but knowledge of this association could prompt molecular profiling early on in patients with hypercalcemia. When we reviewed the frequency in management of hypercalcemia, we observed that patients with ICC received bisphosphonates for treatment and patients with ECC did not. After taking a closer look as to why this was, we found that patients with ICC were more likely to have bone metastases at the time of their first hypercalcemic event compared to patients with ECC. Additionally, we also found patients with ICC had numerically higher rates of grade three or four hypercalcemia and a numerically higher rate of hospitalizations compared to patients with ECC, but this was not statistically significant. When we compared the differences in survival outcomes, we found that patients with ICC who presented with hypercalcemia had a median overall survival of 8.8 .8 months compared to 12.6 months in patients with normal calcemia. This trend towards a poor prognosis in hypercalcemia is in line with what is seen in other cancers. So in conclusion, hypercalcemia was seen more frequently in ICC than ECC, and one third of patients with ICC had hypercalcemia. Hypercalcemia was associated with uh, a higher burden of metastatic disease in both ICC and ECC. Nearly 60% of patients with IDH1 mutated cholangiocarcinoma had hypercalcemia. Bisphosphonates were more commonly used in ICC for treatment of hypercalcemia, and this may have been due to the greater presence of bone metastases at the time of hypercalcemia. And patients with ICC who presented with hypercalcemia diagnosis had a trend towards a shorter overall survival. Lastly, I just want to thank the patients and their families. Uh, thank you to Jordan, Jen, and Stephanie for their help with the data collection. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Irene and Dr. Goyle for their guidance and feedback on preparing for this presentation, as well as for giving me the opportunity to present this data on behalf of our team. And thank you to the collaborating physicians who also aided in the study. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks very much indeed. Um, uh, no, uh, just a few questions, really. Um, so, do you think it's just related to purely the fact that these intrahepatics get bigger? It's it's a size thing. Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, we it could be related to that. We also looked into um, other variables that may have been contributing to it. We looked into uh, parathyroid hormone related protein as mm. well as vitamin D levels. But unfortunately, you know, this is a retrospective study, so we did have limitations to the amount of data available to us. Um, so we weren't able to definitively conclude if there were other variables contributing to the, the um, hypercalcemia. Um, I mean, that's, that's, that's so interesting because um, I know I know you pointed out that there are more, more bone metastases, but of course, patients with bone metastasis also have parathyroid-related protein. So, you know, you, you need to do the test to differentiate between the two. Um, fascinating, the stuff about IDH1 uh, and, and the mutations. Having said that, however, you know, 25% hypercalcemia in IDH1 negative patients, that's still pretty high. You know, that's, that's, you're not, you're not getting away with it if just because you happen to be um, IDH1 wild type. So that's, um, uh, but but fifty cent seven percent. I mean that's that's really uh, that's really remarkable. Just remind us of the total number of patients that contributed to that fifty seven percent. Um. So that fifty seven percent. That was oops, sorry. So five patients, ten patients, thirty patients. The fifty seven. That was about twenty one patients. Uh, patients. We had an IDH one mutation. Okay. Um, yeah. Excellent. Okay, that's brilliant. Thank you very much, Islam. That's that's uh, top stuff, and um, and uh, we need to know how to deal with it better because it's a major problem. Um, thank you. Next up, Miguel Martin from uh, Mount Sinai. Is, here we are. Hi. Uh, good afternoon. Morning. Morning. Uh, Is you. going to talk to us about uh, the immune infiltrate um, in cholangiocarcinoma. And he's done a lot of stuff, including single cell sequencing. So, uh, so take it away. 
Thank you so much. So, good morning, everyone. My name is Miguel Angel Martin, and I'm a postdoctoral fellow in the Division of Liver Disease in Daniela C.S. Laboratory at Icahn School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Intrapatic angiocarcinoma, severity malignancy with increasing incidence and dismal prognosis. Previous studies of large human cohort have proposed distant molecular classifications based on tumor molecular features but none of them specifically assess information of the tumor microenvironment. Our aim was to devise a novel ICCA classifier able to integrate elements from the stroma, tumor, and immune microenvironment, what we call STEAM classification. By applying a virtual deconvolution, we have identified five novel STEAM clusters indicated by different colors at the top of the heat map which encapes both inflamed and non-inflamed profiles. On a heat map, red means high gene expression, while, low, while blue means low gene expression. Inflamed clusters include immune classical and inflammatory stroma cluster. Both clusters resemble hot tumors with high immune infiltration, what was confirmed by HNA staining. Inflammatory stroma cluster present highest stroma deposition with enrichment of signatures capturing presence of cancer-associated fibroblasts. Hepatic stem-like, tumor classical, and desert-like cluster resemble cold tumors with scarce immune infiltration. Desert-like cluster so with the lowest immune infiltration. An hepatic stem-like cluster overlap with previously reported ICCA class with stem cell features. By performing an immune deconvolution using the Sabersot tool, we observed that not only the amount of immune infiltration, but also the immune composition was different across the five STEAM cluster. In particular, we observed higher presence of, of CTA T cells and gamma delta T cells in immune classical and inflammatory stroma clusters. On the other hand, M2 macrophages were enriched in hepatic stem like cluster and regulatory T cells were significantly higher in the desert-like cluster. The results of the immune deconvolution were conferred by immune staining for CD8 and the regulatory T cell marker FOXP3. We then correlate the five esteem clusters with mutations in the most commonly altered driver genes. We observe that BAP1 and ADH1 and 2 mutations were more frequently in hepatic stem-like cluster. K-RAS mutations were, more, were enriched in inflammatory stroma cluster. And tumor classical and desert-like cluster saw the highest rate of TP53 mutation. The 5 steam clusters were enriched in different targetable molecular pathways. Both immune classical and inflammatory stroma cluster were enriched in inflammatory pathways. But while immune classical cluster is enriched in metabolism pathways, the inflammatory stroma cluster is enriched in several oncogenic pathways such as KRAS and TP53. Hepatic stem-like cluster is enriched in notch and jab. Tumor classical cluster is enriched in cell cycle pathways. And desert-like cluster is enriched in wind beta catenin Finally, we try to verify to which extent currently used animal models of ICCA recapitulates the human cluster. To this goal, we generate four previously reported animal models by hydrodynamic Talbay injection. The models that we use are KRASP19, Notch AKT, JAP AKT, and FBX W7 AKT. By applying the STEAM classification, to an RNA sequencing analysis, the prediction suggests that KRAS-P19 mouse model recapitulates with the inflammatory stroma cluster, with enrichment in the same molecular pathways. On the other hand, Notch AKT, JAP AKT, and FBXW7 AKT mice models rec mostly recapitulate with hepatic stem-like cluster. A deeper analysis of this mouse model is currently ongoing. Thank you for your attention. That's great. Thank you very much indeed. That's 
totally fascinating. Just just to clarify, um, the the original data you used to get your five classifiers, that, that was uh, expression data. It comes from a, tra a training data set that we have with uh, 122 patients of IC ICCA. Okay, okay, all all ICC. And yeah, yes, all the all the samples of that we have comes from patients with intrahepatic uh, carcinoma. Okay. That's great. That's number one. The second question I've, I've got a few uh, is 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 around the um, is around the relationship between say the inflammatory and the and 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 RAS mutations. RAS mutations actually not that common in in ICC. Only about twenty percent, isn't it? Um, have you got a mechanism for that? What what's going on there? Uh, no, we didn't check any of the the mechanism. We correlated the. Uh... As I present the 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 of the different clusters that we have, the, we observed that the key rash mutation was enriched in the in the inflammatory in the inflammatory stomach cluster and also that uh, it, it in the tumor classical in the um, desert like cluster where there was a co occurrence with the TP50 and the key rash. No, 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 that's that, I I think I I picked that up. Why? Why? Well, why is it enriched? Uh, I don't. I wouldn't, uh, okay. I wouldn't. <laughs> so, um, that's that's next week's job then. Okay. That yeah. that that's brilliant. The clusters, mutations, perfect, perfect platform for the next experiment. What's the next experiment going to be? Uh, now we are uh, uh, we are trying. As I said, we are doing a deeper analysis with a mouse model because the, I th we think that it's a. Uh, it's a good platform when we could check the different strategies of uh, therapeutics uh, of, of different. Uh, sorry, um, we are uh, we are um, we are on a deeper analysis of the different mouse models that uh, that we saw you the KRAS P19 and um, and the other models to use them as as a as a platform when we when we could check the different uh, therapeutics uh, options or. Okay. Okay. Brilliant. Thanks very much indeed. Um, that's really, really nice stuff. Thank you very much for that. Um, so you. with that, we'll, we'll move right on. And our next presenter is Cecilia. Cecilia, I think Monge is how you pronounce it. Forgive me if I've got that wrong. Oh, is, that, is that correct, Monge? Yes, that's perfect. Good afternoon. <laughs> Thank you for having us. So I'm presenting a study uh, from the National Cancer Institute um, the gastrointestinal malignancies branch, uh, Dr. Gretton is the PI of this study. And this is a phase two study we conducted of pembrolizumab in combination with capecitabine and oxaliplatin in patients with advanced uh, biliary tract carcinoma. So a bit of background. So the understanding of the potential role of immunotherapy in the treatment of um, biliary tract cancers is still limited and an area of ongoing research. Currently, uh, the most common second-line chemotherapy regimen in advanced uh, disease is modified fall fox, and that comes from ABC06 uh, phase three study. And basically, with this study, we aim to cause immunogenic cell death with the backbone of chemotherapy. So using uh, capecitabine and oxaliplatin, um, and using capecitabine instead of the 5-FU because capecitabine can be given orally and uh, and that was uh, a benefit to the patients. And we were hoping to potentiate the action of the immune checkpoint inhibitor with the immunogenic cell death uh, caused by the backbone of chemotherapy. The primary objective of the study was to determine the five month progression free survival of uh, Pembro in combination with um, KPOX in these patients. The secondary objectives included uh, safety, tolerability, and feasibility of the combination as well as evaluating the response rate and the overall survival of these patients. And exploratory objectives included measuring changes in pdl one expression in the tumors, comparing baseline to on-treatment biopsies, and measuring changes in immune parameters in paired tumor biopsies as well. So patients that were 18 years or older with histologically confirmed uh, biliary tract cancer that were not candidates for uh, potentially curative or resection or transplant 
and that had progressed on at least one line of systemic therapy or had refused um, first line systemic chemotherapy were candidates for this study. Patients that were enrolled on the study received uh, pembrolizumab on day one of cycles one through six. They also received oxaliplatin on day one of cycles one through six. And they received capecitabine orally on days one through day 14 of cycles one through six. So basically the cycle lengths was three weeks. And of these three weeks, the first six cycles, the patients were receiving two weeks of oral capecitabine with one week off. And then starting on cycle seven, the patients did not receive any more oxaliplatin or capecitabine and only received a pembrolizumab every three weeks until disease progression. We followed them with imaging with CT scans every nine weeks and they got a pre-treatment biopsy on cycle one, day one, and then on treatment biopsy at approximately day 43 uh, on study. So between June 2017 and February of 2020, a total of 11 patients were enrolled on the study. The median age of the population was 67 with a range of 51 to 81. 55% of the patients were female. Seven of 11 patients had an ECOG performance status of zero with the remaining having a score of one. More than one third of patients had metastatic disease and 54% of patients had received two or more systemic chemotherapy treatments. So most patients have received treatment with platinum-based cytotoxic agents before studies. So the most commonly used was, was GEMSYS, which is currently first-line standard of care for these patients. Importantly, three patients were chemotherapy naive, as we can see on the table. Most patients had intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. Three patients had gallbladder cancer. The average time in weeks between diagnosis of biliary tract cancer and consent on to study was 57 weeks, ranging from four to 182 weeks. So all patients were evaluable for response. Two patients had progressive disease, six stable disease, and three partial response. Altogether, they completed a median of 6.5 cycles, and we can see the range from 5.5 to 8.5 cycles on treatment with a median potential follow-up of 34.8 months. Interestingly, the overall disease control rate, so included in that would be partial response and stable disease was 81.8%. This from a plot, we can see the time on study and the re response status. So each bar represents one patient the three bars with the asterisks represent the patients with gallbladder cancer. The patient who remained on study the longest period of time had stable disease as we can see, and was on study for 7.7 .7 months. The reason for discontinuation in all patients was radiologically confirmed uh, disease progression. This waterfall plot, we can see the radiographic responses, basically, the values show the best fractional change of the sum of the longest diameters from the baseline measurements. And then the, confer the colored bars indicate confirmed responses assessed by RESIST 1.1. The patient with the best response had a reduction of 70% of measured lesions in a three month time period. These are representative CT images at baseline and on treatment of two patients that had a partial response. So in panels A and B, we can see a perihepatic lymph node that decreased in size from approximately 2.7 to 1.9 centimeters. And then in panel C and D, we can see a decrease in number and size of intrahepatic tumor lesions. The median uh, progression-free survival for the patients was 4.1 months and the six month percentage progression free survival was 45.5%. Five of 11 patients progressed beyond five months. 
The median overall survival was 9.9 .9 months with a six month overall survival percentage of 81.8% and an 18 month overall survival percentage of 18.2. The most common uh, treatment related toxicity of any grade included fatigue and nausea. And in this table, we can see that the most common grade three to four adverse event we saw was decreased lymphocyte count seen in 64% of the patients or seven, anemia seen in 36%, and then after that decreased platelet count in 27% and hyponatremia seen in three patients as well. This table shows five pretreatment biopsies from five patients and then four on-treatment biopsies that were analyzed. Interestingly, PL1 expression was not correlated with the effectiveness of treatment. So we can see that two pretreatment biopsies that were negative for PDL1 then went on to have stable disease and a partial response. Whereas there's other three pretreatment biopsies that were positive for PDL1, and this ranged from 1 to 20%. And these patients presented with partial response, stable disease, but with progressive disease as well. So these pathology slides show a T cell infiltration in a tumor that showed partial response on study. So the baseline biopsies are panels A through D, and uh, we can see on H and E baseline a poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma with little to no infiltration by T cells, we can see that with the CD3 and CD8 staining. But focal staining of 1 to 5% of tumor cells by antibody to PDL1. And then we can see a biopsy of lesion on treatment, and those are panels E through H that shows a similar tumor morph morphology in E uh, with a mild infiltrate of CD3 cells in F, some positivity for CD8. And anti PDL1 stain that was negative. And we can see that in panel H. So, in summary, we conclude that K box in combination with pembrolizumab is tolerable, as we can see with the adverse events and a potentially effective treatment for refractory biliary tract cancer. This is a small group of patients. We had a disease control rate of 81.8% with a median progression-free survival of 4.1 months and a median overall survival of 9.9 .9 months. Fantastic. Thank you. That's <laughs> Thank great. You. Thank you very, very much, Cecilia. That's very well, very clearly put. Um, nice little study. I have a few questions and then, well, a few questions. Um, so uh, was it the, I, I I think I heard you correctly. There were three treatment naive patients in there. That's that's correct. And uh, were they were they the ones who responded? No, um, one of them had a partial response. Right. Two of them had a progressive disease, so it wasn't oh, okay. correlated with that. Mm -hmm. Okay, clearly not. Um, were any of the patients MSI MSI? No, that was an exclusion criteria. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, you've already told us about the PD-1, and then did you have you got the the, the profiles of these people? Um, were they all? Uh, uh, yeah, did they have any what we call actionable alterations? Yes. Yeah, so we did um, sequencing on all of these patients, and it's actually still um, underway um, with the idea of publishing this study, of course. But no, they did not have any actionable mutations. Um, okay. that we know until now would uh, be targetable. Okay, okay, I, and and in some ways, you know, there are, there are other studies for them to go into if they did. Exactly, yes. Yeah. And that's why okay. we, we sequenced them uh, to make sure that nothing was being missed and they didn't have any better option than, than the study. That's great. Um, Kabir wants to know about TMB. Any high TMB? We're still analyzing the TMB, but... Okay. Um, I, we wouldn't expect very high TMB from what we know of biliary tract cancers, but that's uh, one of the things that we're looking at uh, prior to publishing the study. Okay, that's that's brilliant. Very nice little study. What's next? Where are you going to take it? Well, I think that um, we 
are very interested in looking at a larger amount of patients, either in a randomized fashion or um, thinking of other ways to potentiate uh, immunotherapy uh, within biliary tract carcinoma. So um, as we know, there are some phase two studies out there that are combining chemotherapy with immunotherapy, uh, specifically GEMSYS with immunotherapy. So we're sort of moving this to uh, first line because as, as you well pointed out, three of our patients were first line because they had refused mm. uh, first line uh, chemotherapy. But really the idea of the study was to do this in second line. So I think that all of those areas are potential uh, venues where, where we could go forward, either with looking at, at this combination in earlier phases or in a randomized fashion, or thinking of other ways that we can potentiate uh, immunotherapy and its effectiveness within these cancers. Excellent. Okay, very nice, um, very nice, uh, um, very nice presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Cecilia. Thank you. So, uh, moving on to our fourth uh, victim, Colm O'Rourke, um, University of Copenhagen. You're there. Brilliant. <laughs> Welcome, and you're going to tell us uh, about. Scrambles around for his for his uh, explanation. Um, why didn't you tell us what you're going to tell us about? I'm sorry, sure. I've just lost my crib. Thank you. No problem. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks very much to the CCF for providing us the opportunity to present uh, some of our ongoing work, which is part of an international collaboration in which we're applying RNA-based or transcriptome profiling to try to understand the molecular basis of response to chemotherapy in ICC patients. So to date, the majority of genome-wide data has been generated for resectable ICCA, even though these patients represent a minority of diagnoses. Uh, patients with advanced ICCA, as well as recurrent ICCA, then go on to receive systemic chemotherapy, which, as we saw yesterday in the excellent session, can greatly benefit from being genomically informed. Standard of care with GEMSYS achieves approximately a, an overall survival of around 12 months, as per the ABCO2 trial. However, uh, response and benefit of chemotherapy varies between patients, and it's important to be able to predict the, uh, which patients will not benefit from GEMSYS, uh, especially to allocate them towards potential other uh, therapeutic avenues. But more generally, it's important to understand the molecular basis of resistance to GEMSYS to develop new therapeutic strategies. So the traditional DNA-centric overview of chemoresistance ascribes uh, Innate chemo resistance to the existence prior to treatment of a genetically distinct subpopulation of tumor cells, and this is really what we capture when we perform DNA based. Sorry to, inter sorry to interrupt, Colm. Uh, can you put your presentation in the slideshow mode so that everyone can see the slides as you're going through? It, uh, it, 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 it was just in the uh, regular slide deck mode. Just put it in the slideshow mode, please. Uh, is that okay now? No? I don't see any slides. Matt, can you help? Your screen is not shared. You've got to share your screen and then put it into slideshow mode. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, no problem. Uh, hopefully everyone can see now. Did you, sh have you share? Oh, there you go. Now put it in the slideshow mode. And um, it is in slideshow mode uh, according to my computer. It might be. Do you have two screens? Uh, no, I have an external monitor. Yeah. Okay. Are you sharing that 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 particular screen? Uh, no. Okay, you got to share that screen. Uh, whatever well, screen. Whatever screen the slideshow mode is on is what you have to share. Um, I understand that, and it was working earlier, but let me... Uh... Sorry, everyone, for the uh, interruption, just to make sure that everyone can see. Why don't we um, why don't we move on if that's okay with John um, and the team? We can start with the second uh, the second group and um, 
we will of course get him get him back to uh, to showtime. So uh, I think what we'll do is go on with um, Dr. Roy Chaudhry. There he is. We have Sam Samik Roy Chaudhry from the Ohio State University, who is going to present uh, on behalf of a number of investigators um, results from a uh, trial of infogratinib for the ever popular FGFR2 fusion positive cholangiocarcinoma. Go for it. You, Kabir, just a quick check. You can see this screen. Yep, you're, you're all good. Nice. Uh, so thank you so much uh, to the cholangiocarcinoma foundation and uh, especially to all of the patients who are participating uh, in this meeting and research, uh, this is for you. Uh, it's my pleasure to present this clinical trial, uh, a phase two study of a FGFR inhibitor called infogratinib. Uh, on behalf of our patients, investigators from all of these great institutions, uh, and, and so I'm happy to walk you through it. So here are a few of my disclosures. So fibroblast growth factor receptor alterations can be targeted with infogratinib. That's the take home message. And FGFR alterations in cholangiocarcinoma are, are mostly what we call gene fusions, rearrangements, translocations, sometimes truncations. And what they involve is the FGFR2 gene breaking, losing a piece and reattaching a new piece. And some, we're not sure how important that other piece is, but the FGFR2 piece can drive cancer growth and uh, spread of the cancer and hopefully can be targeted by trying to turn off that gene's activities. Uh, that gene activates uh, a signaling cascade and new smart drugs can target it. Infogratinib is such a, a FGFR kinase inhibitor uh, it can affect multiple FGFR receptors in addition to FGFR2. And so that's the premise of this clinical trial. It's a phase two study uh, now ongoing for about seven or eight years or so. Uh, this is for patients with unresectable, locally advanced or metastatic cholangiocarcinoma. This is again, mostly intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma where we see the majority of FGFR alterations. Patients had to have had at least one type of gemcitabine-based chemotherapy, and of course had to qualify with the presence of one of these FGFR alterations. The therapy uh, is an oral therapy, so pills once a day for three weeks and then one week off. And that's a month of treatment. And the main endpoints of the study, although there are many others, are the objective response rate, so how many people shrink their tumors and the duration of response. So how long does that benefit last? Uh, in this diagram, we show uh, that there have been 122 or so enrolled patients. Uh, the data that I'm gonna show you is based on a, a group of 108 patients uh, with a cutoff of data uh, sometime this past year. And most of the patients uh, uh, in the study had FGFR2, so that's what we're gonna show. Uh, but there were other patients that had other gene alterations that are potentially important as well, but they're just not as common and harder to study. And so we'll talk about these 108 patients worth of uh, treatment. Uh, this is a chart that we call a waterfall plot because it somewhat looks like a waterfall uh, depending on your angle of view. Uh, on the y-axis on the left is the percentage change in tumor measurements. So did the tumor grow or shrink from, from the baseline of zero? Uh, so any bars uh, representing a patient going up are tumor growth despite the treatment. That's, the, that, that's what happened and they probably had to stop treatment at some point. Bars going below the x-axis that are at a negative percentage or shrinkage of tumor. And the dotted line you see represents the cutoff that we use in clinical trials of, for partial response. And so, uh, to the far right, we see a number of bars going beyond that. And so that represents our objective response rate of 23%. Uh, and not to, to, to uh, not, not appreciate the, the other patients that had stable disease where their tumors did shrink, in fact, but may just not have reached that 
threshold of 30%. Uh, these are certainly patients who are benefiting with hopefully long-term and durable control of their disease. Uh, I, I've seen one of these patients go on for three or four years, at least two patients, who never met the criteria for partial response. So uh, not having a partial response doesn't mean you can't benefit greatly. This is a table summarizing some of these measures in the clinical trial that were our primary and secondary endpoints. Again, the main one was this objective response rate of 23%. The uh, median time to response was 3.6 months. And that's important to know because you may not see a response right away. Uh, and so some of these tumors may appear to be slow growing and slow to respond, uh, though some are fast growing. Uh, so it's so a median time though to see that benefit is, is about three and a half months. So you have to be patient. Uh, if you haven't seen it shrink after the first two months of treatment, it may still shrink further. Uh, the other number I'd like to point out here is this 84%, which represents this disease control rate. So again, you know, how many of our patients are actually benefiting uh, even with stable disease, we see great benefit and, and durability of that response. Uh, and then finally, uh, uh, the other number I want to point out here is uh, what we call median progression-free survival. So how long did they remain on therapy before we had to stop therapy because of progression? That's also depicted here in these two graphs. On the left is progression-free survival, um, and then on the right is the overall survival uh, the median time to progression is about 7.3 months, uh, and the median time to progression uh, is uh, a, a median uh, overall survival is 12.2 months. Uh, but there are certainly patients above and below that, and so uh, that gives us an idea. Uh, but we also don't have the precise knowledge to know that which patient's going to do what. And, and so there were patients who did not respond to therapy a fraction. Uh, there were patients who had you know, great shrinkage of tumor. So more research is needed to help understand uh, what goes beyond having an FGFR2 positive cholangiocarcinoma uh, and, and what do we do with that knowledge. So, so to summarize, uh, infragratinib is a, one of the oral FGFR inhibitors uh, uh, effective for FGFR1 through 3. Uh, the confirmed overall response rate, which includes partial responses and shrinkage of tumors, 23%. Uh, duration of this response was five months, median progression-free survival, seven and a half months. Uh, and again, the time to get that response is around three and a half months. So uh, infragradinib, which I didn't talk about today, was well tolerated as far as side effects, similar to other FGFR inhibitors. Uh, and uh, this, of course, was tested in patients who had had at least one prior therapy, uh, but may have had maybe two, three, or four prior therapy before entering the study. So it can be effective even beyond uh, a couple therapies. So we most importantly like to acknowledge the patients and their families uh, who've traveled and driven and flown great distances to be part of these studies. Uh, and uh, this is all for you, of course, uh, and more work to be done uh, on, on improving your lives. So thank you. Thank you, Samik. That was fantastic. And given that, you know, um, we've heard, we are obviously hearing a lot about FGFR2 fusion positive clangio. Uh, this meeting, especially in, and in prior meetings, and given that this is one of the sort of earlier data sets, um, tell us more about what you guys are doing with all this, all the tissue, and hopefully circulating tumor DNA that you have, and, and the correlative work that that's going on um, by the team to to expand our knowledge. Yeah, it's a great question. You know, uh, we've seen great benefit for patients who are FGFR positive cancers getting these FGFR therapies. Uh, you saw, though, that pa patients at some point have growth of their tumor, uh, mm -hmm. and they also have side effects that have accumulated. So those are the things we want to work on. So understanding through the, the research in these studies, so repeat tumor biopsies, uh, serial blood sampling is helping us characterize the features of that person's tumor and what's changing and, and uh, what is driving that so-called resistance. So if you think about it, you know, bacteria become resistant to antibiotics. Uh, tumors can become resistant to chemotherapies or targeted therapies. And understanding that is helping us think about the next generation of drugs. Uh, all of the FGFR drugs we're talking about that are getting approvals are, are really the first generation. So we're really hopeful to understand uh, how our patients have benefited, why they have progression of their cancer. 
uh, but through research based on those samples uh, to look at the genetics and other features. How can we do better? So how can we prevent resistance? How can we make better drugs? How can we make drugs that have fewer side effects? Um, so, so hopefully that answers your question to, to a certain extent. And, and um, is there a, a question from the audience? Is, is sort of, uh, I don't think this was the cohort that you were talking about, but I think that there was a cohort in the study um, for patients who had prior FGFR2 inhibitor therapy. Um, certainly that's a, a hot area um, uh, of investigation and, and hopefully the next approval that comes um, in this space uh, as we as we know that patients develop resistance to the um, to the drugs they're on. So, can you is there any comment on on those patients or is the data still uh, emerging? That's a great question. So, so we have what we think are first generation drugs, and 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 there are these mutations that can drive resistance to those first generation drugs. Uh, there are a couple agents that we think could be effective against some of these acquired resistance mutations. Uh, uh, you know, covalent inhibitors, which work differently uh, than the transient inhibitors, uh, and, and certainly other compounds coming as well. Uh, and so we don't know the answer to sequential therapy for everybody, uh, but, but it does make sense for certain of these FGFR inhibitors to be tried uh, after, you know, progressing on the first type. Um, you know, I've also had experience um, kind of alternating Instead of going from you know another FGFR drug to another FGFR drug, you know I've had you know some luck and experience uh, with getting responses going to a different chemotherapy, uh, and perhaps a chemotherapy. You know if I've had a patient who had chemotherapy four years ago, do a year of FGFR and then progress, we've had success retreating them with that same chemotherapy from five years ago, mm -hmm. um, which, which is not a usual situation that to be in, but, but, but it has worked. Um, yeah. so. Fantastic. All right. Well, um, I think what we'll do is we'll move on to uh, Natalia next. Thank you so, so much, Samik, for that great presentation. Um, so next, we're going to talk with uh, Dr. Natalia Paez Arango, right? Uh, right. She's, she's from MD Anderson. And she, you know, we've heard a little bit about neoadjuvant therapy in this conference, which, which is fantastic because it's a rising area of investigation. We've heard a couple of people refer to a couple of clinical trials which are ongoing. Um, but you guys at MD Anderson have been doing, uh, uh, have been, have also been doing neoadjuvant for a while. So you're going to talk about your, um, retrospective uh, look at, at, at your data, right? Thank yes, you yes. <laughs> well, thank you so much for the opportunity to present today. I'm going to talk about pathologic response and outcomes after neoadjuvant chemotherapy for potentially resectable intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. I have no disclosures. The use of neoadjuvant chemotherapy for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma has not yet been standardized, and, there, and thus there is much to learn regarding outcomes and predictors of survival for these patients. In this study, we analyzed the experience at our institution with neoadjuvant chemotherapy on patients with high-risk intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma who underwent resection, focusing on the significance of pathologic response. And so, we queried a prospectively maintained database for all consecutive patients that underwent resection after neoadjuvant chemotherapy, and 45 patients were identified. The median follow-up for these patients was 30 months, median age 61 and 42% were female. The majority were considered stage three at time of diagnosis, and the indications for neoadjuvant chemotherapy included high-risk features such as lymphadenopathy or vascular involvement, performance status, as well as patients who received chemo for what was originally thought to be metastatic adenocarcinoma. The chemo regimens mostly consisted of gemcitabine with cisplatin um, or gemcitabine, cisplatin, uh, braxane or carboplatin, and we had a couple of patients who received uh, Folfox. 75% of the patients had an R0 resection with clear margins um, greater than one millimeter. And for the entire cohort, the median overall survival was 45 months with a recurrence-free survival of nine months. We then assessed 
the pathologic response independently by having a pathologist who was blinded to the patient's clinical course review the specimen sliced. We define major pathologic response as less than 50% viable tumor cells according to the definition used in prior studies for colorectal liver meds. With this definition, um, Sorry. <laughs> With this definition, 39% of the patients had a major pathologic response, um, two of which had a complete response. 61% had a minor response. Unfortunately, there was no significant difference in overall survival for recurrence-free survival or recurrence-free survival for patients who had a major versus minor response. Paradoxically, the median overall survival for the patients that had major response was 44 months. Um, versus 75 months for those with minor response. The median recurrence-free survival uh, was 14 months for major pathologic response versus 11 months for those who had minor pathologic response. We also looked at um, survival according to the margin status. And unfortunately, there was also no significant difference in this small cohort. In conclusion, pathologic response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy is not associated with improved survival after resection of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. However, taking into consideration that this study involved a group of such high-risk patients, the overall survival is still encouraging of the use of neoadjuvant chemotherapy, particularly when you compare it with other groups, for instance, with the BILCAP study, where these patients who were clearly resectable after adjuvant chemo, their survival was 53 months. In this cohort, we had a high risk uh, group. This means we need to continue our studies and focus on objective biomarkers of response that may help us better prognosticate uh, post-resection survival. Thank you so much. Wow, thank you for, uh, for the quick presentation. Um, we don't have any questions yet, but um, uh, my question, you know, I'm a little bit, I was a little bit um, intrigued that there wasn't a difference between the groups, as I'm as I'm sure you were. Um, how do you how do you explain that? Is that do you think primarily because of the high risk nature of these patients anyway, and that sort of overtaking in terms of um, survival outcomes or or what? How how do you explain how do you explain that? I I think so. We had it's a small cohort of patients that are all high risk. So to begin with. Um, the vast, the majority of patients, their tumors did not respond to chemotherapy. And I think for those that did respond, uh, it's advanced disease. So their, their prognosis to begin with and their survival is going to be reduced. Right. Um, and did you look at the difference in uh, pathologic outcomes, um, you know, based on the regimen that they got? I mean, you know, the majority of patients got gem cysts, but there was about a quarter of patients or a third of patients who got uh, gap therapy. And, and as Dr. Shroff had alluded to, you know, there's a lot of, uh, I think there are a couple of studies now um, exploring gap as a, as potentially a, a more effective um, uh, uh, neoadjuvant uh, strategy. But um, did you guys notice any difference? Did you look at that at all? We did. It wasn't statistically significant, uh, just more, it, it looked a little bit different, but it wasn't significant for a difference. Yeah. Okay. Good. So I don't think we have any other questions. Um, are we good to go with Dr. Wang? I think we are. So our next presenter is um, Dr. Lian Wang um, from UCSF. We have a uh, a pair of presenters from, from UCSF. And, and she's gonna talk about some really intriguing work that she's done with the group there on looking at um, IDH mutation metabolism uh, impacts uh, and DNA damage impacts um, uh, in, in cell lines. So go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, hello, my name is Lian Wong. I'm presenting today on behalf of the Goran Lab at UCSF. Um, I want to thank the organizers uh, for this year's conference for inviting me to speak today. And I'll be presenting on IDH1 mutation-induced metabolism, enhancing the ATR check one mediated DNA damage response. So around 13% of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma carcinoma have a mutation in isocitrate dehydrogenase, or IDH. Um, this is a metabolic enzyme in the TCA cycle. 
and Ivacinib or AG120 um, by IGS Pharmaceuticals is a mutant IDH specific inhibitor. And it's currently FDA approved for treating acute myeloid leukemia. Um, and there is promising clinical data for ICC, um, as Dr. Matesh Baraj shared yesterday, um, but it's not yet approved. So the purpose of our study is to see the effects of mutant IDH on ICC biology to identify new therapeutic targets in IDH mutant ICC. So first of all, what are ATR and CHECK1? Um, a brief summary is that CHECK1 is the kinase that regulates DNA damage checkpoints, and ATR is the kinase that activates CHECK1 in response to detected DNA replication stress. Here are my, my methods. Um, I culture two different ICC mutant IDH cell lines um, with or without AG120 for multiple weeks to determine the impact of mutant IDH um, in these assays. So onto the results, um, we first did a kinome-wide SRA knockdown in the presence or absence of AG120. We found that when we knocked down um, ATR and CHECK1 that this negatively impacted cell viability in the untreated mutant IDH um, compared to the AG120 treated. Um, and this is consistent with um, current clinical data as well as the data that Dr. Timothy Yap shared yesterday. Um, and this also showed us that the cell lines that we chose um, are good models for looking at this pathway. Um, so now that we know that ATR and CHECK1 are important in mutant IDH, uh, we want to see if there's differential activation um, of, mu uh, of CHECK1 um, between parental and AG120 treated cells um, in response to DNA damage induced by various chemotherapies. So here we can see in response to gemcitabine, um, the parental or untreated cells have greater CHECK1 activation compared to AG120 treated. And we saw the same trend um, with exposure to hydroxyurea as well. And since CHECK1 is a cell cycle checkpoint kinase, we wanted to compare the cell cycle progression between untreated and treated cells. So we synchronized them and then allowed them to re-enter the cell cycle. And 24 hours later, um, you can see that the AG120 treated cells seem to be progressing faster. So more of them are um, progressed into S and G2M phase compared to the parental or untreated counterparts. Um, so this shows us that the uh, reduced, H, uh, reduced check one activation in the AG120 treated cells that we saw in the Western blots does correspond with um, less checkpoint activation um, and seemingly faster cell cycle progression as well. Uh, we also um, later found out that gemcitabine hydroxyurea um, that we used for the Western blot experiments are also both ribonucleotide reductase inhibitors. Um, and ribonucleotide reductase is an enzyme that synthesizes deoxyribonucleotides. Um, and ARM1 and 2 are the genes of the subunits of this enzyme. And here's a log twofold change of the gene expression um, of AG120 treated relative to DMSO control. So you can see that upon AG120 treatment, um, there is an upregulation or recovery of expression of um, ribonucleotide reductase in mutant IDH ICC, and we also knocked down RM1 with siRNA. And we can see here that um, both at baseline, but especially after gemcitabine exposure, um, there is significantly greater CHECK1 activation um, in the RM1 knockdown. So this data um, suggests to us that um, CHECK1 activation in mutant IDH ICC um, is likely linked to reduced nucleotide synthesis or nucleotide availability. And our RNA-seq data seems to agree with this. Here on the left is a volcano plot of all the genes we looked at in this screen, and we took these significant genes and um, put them through an analysis tool called Enricher to see what biological processes they're involved in. Um, and we saw downregulation in red of mitochondrial genes, um, as well as upregulation in blue of ribosomal genes. And mitochondria are involved with nucleotide synthesis and ribosomes require a lot of nucleotides um, in their structure. So this is how um, the RNA-seq data um, connects to nucleotide availability. So for conclusions, when we're comparing untreated versus AG120 treated mutant IDH ICC, um, we see decreased viability upon knockdown of ATR and CHECK1, increased CHECK1 activation in response to gemcitabine and hydroxyurea, slower progression into G2M phase, drastically increased CHECK1 activation upon ribonucleotide reductase knockdown, and lastly, a differential expression of ribosomal and mitochondrial genes. That's fantastic. Thank you for that work. Um, so uh, I'm a little bit intrigued by the 
results of the check one activation differing between gem related or gem dosing. Um, do you uh, do you have any data about cell kill differential um, following that? I mean, there are currently there are currently stu studies uh, being planned or ongoing looking at combining AG120 with gemcitabine. Like, would you recommend that they use lower doses of gemcitabine to achieve greater cell kill in the situations, or or how how would you go about that? Okay. May have an issue with uh, Leanne's feed. <laughs> Try and bring her back up here. Sorry. So I'm I'm back up on the screen, which I think Kabir suggests that we're going to go to Colm and we can come back to yeah, Leanne. Absolutely. Because I yeah. also wanted to know the answer to that question. So uh, so let's 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 move on or move backwards in fact so Colm has finally sorted out his his uh his his his, his technical problems we are really looking forward to this um uh, Colm and um I've, I've actually got your title now so you've done you've done some you've done some transcriptomics on intrahepatic cells so let's let's have a look thank you very much exactly thank you very much hello everyone again apologies for the technical issues uh so hopefully you can all see my screens now um, so today I would like to present to you some ongoing work as part of an international collaboration in which we were applying RNA-based or transcriptome profiling to try to understand the molecular basis of chemotherapy response in intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma patients. So uh, to date, uh, the majority of genome-wide profiling has been done on resectable uh, ICC. However, these patients, of course, represent a minority of diagnoses, and it's patients with advanced ICC and recurrent ICC to then go on to receive systemic chemotherapy or other therapies. Um, standard of care with GEMSYS achieves a median overall survival of just under 12 months. However, this response uh, and survival time can significantly vary between patients. And it's really important to be able to understand uh, and predict which patients will rapidly progress on chemotherapy in order to uh, orientate them to alternative protocols uh, if they're available, but more generally also to understand the molecular basis uh, of chemo resistance to identify new therapeutic opportunities. So uh, the DNA-centric overview of chemo resistance uh, attributes innate chemo resistance to the existence of a subset of tumor cells prior to treatment that are genetically distinct. And when we perform DNA-based profiling, this is the overview of innate chemo, chemo resistance that we acquire. However, Non-genetic mechanisms of chemo resistance are also active in tumor cells and other cells within the tumor microenvironments can also contribute to chemo resistance and they do so exclusively through non-genetic mechanisms. So our underlying hypothesis is that baseline transcriptomes reflect the innate chemo resistance potential of tumors and that amongst the heterogeneous ICC population demographic, there exists a subset of patients who exhibit either in tumor cells or in other cells within the microenvironment a high degree of potential innate chemo resistance and following initiation of treatment, uh, these cells rapidly expand, correlating with short survival of these patients. These are in contrast to the long survivors whose pretreatment tissues lack a uh, significant contribution of innate chemo resistance, who initially uh, respond to chemotherapy until a newly acquired mutation occurs. Uh, and then progresses over a much longer period of time, correlating with increased overall survival. So our approach to this was to identify our own uh, patient cohorts of long survivors and rapid progressors. These patients did not significantly differ in terms of clinical features such as sex, age, performance status, disease status, or first-line chemotherapy. However, they did significantly differ in their overall survival on chemotherapy. So we obtained the patient's pre-treatment diagnostic biopsies, we uh, performed uh, transcriptome profiling using a targeted form of sequencing called TempoSeq. And by comparing the transcriptomes of rapid progressors and long survivors, we identified the RPLS chemo resistance signature. This signature is composed of 194 genes that are higher expressed in the rapid progressors and are involved in processes such as notch and TNF signaling, as well as 310 genes that are significantly higher expressed in the long survivors and are involved in processes such as hedgehog and mismatch repair. So histopathological and bioinformatic analysis indicated that there was no significant difference in the cellular composition of the biopsies from long survivors and rapid progressors. So this must indicate that cell type specific reprogramming is occurring. To investigate this, we applied a virtual microdissection approach 
in which we applied machine learning to single cell RNA sequencing data from ICC patients. And this allowed us to derive a signature that could uh, accurately discriminate various cell types within the tumor compartments. And by identifying these signatures, we can then zoom in on these cell types within our own patient biopsies. And to cut a long story short, we found that the majority of the genes in the chemoresistance signature are indeed changing in the tumor cells, however, there's also a significant contribution from the other cells within the tumor tissues. And for example, if we zoom in on the tumor cells, we see the tumor cells have rapid progressors, have higher expression of genes involved in notch signaling, and lower expression of genes involved in cellular adhesion. Whereas, for example, if we zoom in on the macrophages, we find that the macrophages of rapid progressors are highly metabolically distinct and express higher uh, levels of genes involved in MAPK signaling. So given the contribution of immune cells that we observe uh, to our chemoresistance signature, next we want to test whether there's any difference in immune functionality between the long survivors and the rapid progressors. We did this using a transcriptome-based metric called TIDE. And as you can see here, surprisingly, we found that immune cells within the long survivor biopsies are far more dysfunctional than those in the rapid progressors. And since the TIDE metric has previously been shown to accurately predict response to immune checkpoint inhibitors in clinical trials for various solid cancers, we then use this metric to predict immune checkpoint inhibitor responders or predicted responders in our own patient cohort. And remarkably, what we found is that the patients that rapidly progress on chemotherapy are significantly enriched in predicted responders to immune checkpoint inhibitors. So moving from advanced uh, ICC to resected ICC, we next tested our signature in 401 patients spanning four different cohorts, which as you can appreciate are highly geographically diverse. Overall, we found the patients with higher expression of the chemoresistance signature had significantly decreased survival following resection in all four cohorts. In terms of immune functionality, we found the patients with higher uh, chemoresistance signature expression had uh, high, higher microsatellite instability and lower M2 polarization of tumor associated macrophages in all cohorts. Uh, in terms of genomics, we found the tumors with IDH1 mutations had significantly lower expression of the chemoresistance signature. Tumors with KRAS mutations had higher expression of the chemoresistance signature in one cohort, but this was not reproduced in the other. In both cohorts, we found the tumors with TP53 mutations had significantly higher chemoresistance signature expression, and we found no association between the chemoresistance signature expression and FGF42 fusion status. Lastly, we included the RPLS chemoresistance signature into a multivariate Cox proportional hazards model with tumor stage and recurrent genomic alterations. And as you can see here, but the RPLS chemoresistance signature was the most significant independent prognostic feature in both cohorts. So in conclusion, we have demonstrated the whole transcriptome profiling of FFP biopsies is feasible, that the transcriptomes of rapid progressors and long survivors are highly distinct, and that rapid progressor phenotypes appear to involve non-genetic reprogramming in multiple cell types. And from this, we identified the RPLS chemoresistance signature, which allowed us to prognostically stratify ICC patients with distinct clinical, genomic, transcriptomic, and immune characteristics. And with that, I would like to thank everyone involved in the study, in particular Jesper Anderson and Cara Bracconi, who are co-senior authors. Thanks also to Max, who is co-first author. Uh, thanks to our various uh, international chondrocarcinoma networks, and thank you all for listening. Terrific, Colm. It was worth the wait. That was really good. Um, so, um, really beautiful stuff. Uh, very, very, very nice work. The trans, the, that's 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 presumably. Well, what did you use for the positional transcriptomics, Visium or something like that? Uh, to technologically perform it, uh, yeah, we yeah. Use a platform called TempoSeq. So, okay. Tempo -Seek. Yes. Yeah. yeah, no, actually, very, very nice indeed. Um, so, you've got a lovely surrogate, and you've got uh, a chemotherapy outcome. Any idea about a mechanism? Um, it depends on uh, uh, what exactly you're asking a mechanism about. So, for example, we see in terms of the chemotherapy, we see uh, the rapid progressors uh, all die in less than six months. So, in terms of mechanisms for that, we of course have uh, expression of the notch pathway, highly aggressive uh, developmental pathway that promotes epithelial mesenchymal transition and survival of tumor cells in that state. It also uh, promotes uh, angiogenesis and metastatic dissemination. It also is associated with very large cancer stem cell repositories. Okay, but, but the, 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 these are, you know, beautifully demonstrated associations and and surrogates. But it's the, you know, 
um, what's happening on the ground, the mechanism. But that's perhaps a, a we can continue this this conversation uh, at some stage. But uh, but look, very nice work indeed. Thank you. Um, okay, so I think we're going to go back to Leanne. Is that right, Kabir? You're on mute, old chap. Kabir, you're on mute. Yeah, we're going to go back to Leanne. Um, I don't know, oh. Leanne. Uh, so, sorry, I guess your Wi-Fi got switched. Um, yeah. Is that my question at all, or no? Want me to repeat it? Um, yeah, I think I dropped off before you got to yeah. the questions. So yeah. the question um, uh, that we had was, um, I what sort of you know piqued my interest during that presentation, which was very good, was <clears throat> you noticed a difference, uh, differential difference in the check um, activation with lower doses of gemcitabine versus higher, which was which was interesting, and that sort of ties into your your results of um, related to the RRM, um, right? Um, now there are clinical trials um, which are being designed and open now looking at combining gem cis with like AG120. So if you were advising those folks, would you say perhaps to consider lower doses of gem with AG120? Have you looked at the cell kill effects or others uh, in, in that combination? Uh, what would you what would you say? Yeah, um, that's a good question. We have not gone around to um, combining like the usage of these different chemotherapies. Um, and since um, our lab is mainly focused with looking at the signaling, um, we, we do not know like the clinical, um, um, you know, implications or effects um, of, of using them in conjunction. Um, so, yeah, um, I, I don't, I'm not know the answer to that question. Um, but I think that's definitely a good question to like look further into um, for just future treatment of immune IDH ICC. Okay. And what's what's next for you guys? I mean, what what what's what's the follow up to this? Yeah, so we're interested in seeing um, exactly how our nucleotide availability plays into the biology in immune IDH ICC, um, and potentially seeing like other targets that we can um, use as well as other than um, um, RM1. Um, we can see if there's other, um, you know, d d different um, therapies to explore as well. Um, yeah. Fantastic. Well, thanks for your work and for presenting. Um, we're going to move on to Dr. Zhang next, who's also from UCSF, um, from the uh, similar group, um, who's going to be presenting um, retrospective analysis of biopsy outcomes um, in terms of next generation sequencing of tissue and also CFDNA. Uh, take it away. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Karen Zhang, and I'm a clinical research coordinator in GI oncology at the University of California in San Francisco. So on behalf of my co-investigators, I'd like to thank the Clangiocarcinoma Foundation for the invitation to present the results of our study today, which is a retrospective analysis of biopsy outcomes for diagnosis and next generation sequencing of clangiocarcinoma in a single center registry. So to begin with some background, a substantial proportion of patients with cholangiocarcinoma, or CCA for short, have tumor mutations that may benefit from the use of targeted therapies. Tumor next generation sequencing, or NGS, is required to identify these mutations. And so there are some challenges to obtaining both a histologic diagnosis in CCA and tumor NGS results, and that includes an accessible location or scant tumor cell content. So we conducted a retrospective analysis of an institutional registry to assess the outcomes of clinical biopsy to achieve a histologic diagnosis and NGS results according to CCA anatomic subset. So here's a summary of our methods. Eligible patients for the study had a histologic diagnosis of CCA and were enrolled on the UCSF hepatobiliary tissue bank and registry, or HBTBR for short, between February of 2013 and January of 2020. And there were three main endpoints for the study. The first endpoint was the proportion of patients who received a histologic diagnosis upon initial clinical biopsy. The second was the proportion of patients who received a tissue NGS or TNGS result at any point during their care. And the third endpoint was the proportion of patients who had cell-free DNA results as their only source of NGS. And the incidence of clinical biopsy and NGS testing and the corresponding success rates were assessed by reviewing the electronic medical record, including Care Everywhere, 
and scanned external clinical documents. So in total, there were 173 CCA patients who were included in this analysis. Overall, gender was relatively balanced, but of note, there was a slight female preponderance among intrahepatic cases, or ICC, and a slight male preponderance among the extrahepatic cases, which is ECC, and is comprised of hilar and distal CCA. Race and ethnicity were similar across the subsites and were representative of the overall UCSF hepatobiliary cancer population. And staging at enrollment to HBTBR was advanced in 67% of patients overall and was also similar across anatomic subsites. And a median of two tumor sampling events per patient occurred overall during the study follow-up period. So 82% of patients overall had a definitive histologic diagnosis from their first tumor sampling event, though this proportion varied significantly according to anatomic subsite. So here you can see 90% of ICC patients had definitive histologic diagnoses upon the first tissue biopsy versus 63% of ECC patients. And this difference is significant with a p-value of 0.005. And we also looked at um, the rates of successful NGS from any source, so that's tumor or CFDNA, and there was no significant difference between ICC and ECC. However, when we looked at only tumor tissue NGS or TNGS results, we see again that anatomic subsite impacted the success rate. So here, a higher proportion of ICC patients have successful tissue NGS, which is about 70%, in comparison with 47% for ECC. And if we're only looking at hilar CCA, that's only 33%. Cell-free DNA was the only source of NGS in 31% of hilar CCA patients, which was also significantly higher compared to ICC. So in summary, ECC patients had lower proportions of diagnostic tumor histology after their first biopsy. Hilar CCA had the lowest rate of successful tissue NGS results and the highest proportion with CFDNA only as the source of NGS results. Limitations of the study include its retrospective design and dependence on the completeness of the EMR records. But nevertheless, these results quantify the potential for a treatment delay due to repeat biopsy requirements across the subsites and underscores the importance of validating non-invasive NGS methods such as CFDNA um, assays to profile tumors that are inaccessible to biopsy. In the future, we plan to analyze histologic diagnosis and NGS outcomes according to biopsy type and concordance for success on both histologic diagnosis and NGS from individual biopsies. We also plan to quantify the proportion of patients who have treatment delays due to uh, re-biopsy re requirements according to anatomic subsite and biopsy types. And so we hope that this information can help to establish a clinical workflow to optimize the timing sequence of TNGS and CFDNA orders, for example, consideration of ordering tissue NGS and CFDNA NGS in parallel. Um, the goal is to minimize treatment delays and facilitate clinical trial identification. And so I just want to thank Dr. Kelly for her guidance, as well as the HPTBR study team, the Billy Project Foundation, and of course, our patients and families. Thank you. Dr. Modi, I think you're still muted. Thanks. Thanks for that presentation. That was, that was great. Um, one of the main questions I have is, you know, um, what is, uh, what was the percentage of patients who had um, limited or non-successful tissue, um, but successful CTDNA? I don't think you noted that. Maybe you did, maybe I missed it. I so cell free DNA is the only source, okay. Yeah, so they did um, not have tissue NGS available or it was insufficient. It was sent off, but returned insufficient for testing. Okay. And do you, do you know sort of the percentage of patients that you, that, that you had uh, actionable or therapeutically relevant results come out from this or, or no? Um, so we don't quite have that for the poster itself. However, our registry does capture treatment so we will have access or we'll have paired data according to which patients ended up getting targeted yeah. there. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for that for that presentation. All right, we'll bring John. So, so there we go. What did you what did you make of all of that, Kabir? That was a lot of great work um, by a lot a lot of young future uh, 
uh, uh, folks who are going to who move this field forward, to continue to move this field forward, and uh, it was uh, it was it was good. I liked it. No, no, it's um, we need we need those young people to 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 move in there, move it forward. The biology is the biology is is exciting, but the but the studies are also incredibly valuable, um, uh, and. I, I enjoy these things enormously. It shows the power of the coming age of, you know, this uh, bioinformatics, machine learning, AI, you know, this is all going to really make things far more confusing for us than it already is. <laughs> yes. So I, I think, I think uh, I mean, Colm didn't say, but but I think that was, you know, there was a lot of AI in in that. Yeah. And and that's going to be the next, uh, that's going to be the next big thing. Yeah. Yep. Okay, fabulous. So, look, thanks very much indeed, everybody, for 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 staying with us while we while we sort of uh, bumped in and out of schedule. Uh, I think we got there in the end. Uh, lovely to see you, Kabir. This is as good as it gets these days. And uh, we'll um, we'll touch base hopefully uh, in due course. Uh, thanks, everybody, and uh, we'll move back to the main program.